I can I can check it too, but I'm just saying like it's if I'm not paying attention. Yes. Go. All right, everybody. Thanks for joining uh, me and talking about uh, what I'm sure everybody's been thinking about for weeks and months, which is how to learn how to hack mainframes. Given the 20-year anniversary of the uh, Hackers movie, I thought it was appropriate somebody should be talking about this. Um, so I titled this talk, Learning Mainframe Hacking. But really, it should be titled, Where the Hell Did All My Free Time Go? Um, because uh, you'll see. So what I set out to do uh, six or nine months ago, uh, after I decided that uh, I wanted to dig more into mainframe security from a research and development perspective, um, what I set out to do was really learn it for myself, but also to start raising awareness to people who have these platforms, people who don't have these platforms, but maybe have opportunity to work on them. So like if you're part of a pen testing company or you're on a red team somewhere, um, <clears throat> or frankly, if you just you know use things like credit cards or ATMs or cash or airplanes or government services, that you might be interested in this. So um, so I, so I started out, uh, this, this is basically lear learning something net new from, from the ground up. So it's like you take the skills you have, take everything you know, um, and you really roll it up to a high level because most of the technical stuff doesn't, doesn't apply. Um, and then I set out with the goal along, along with getting the uh, information out there is really to take, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of tools, there's some tools out there now, um, there's a lot of tools that need to be built. And so my goal was like, look, if it's out there, I'm going to try to port it into something that, that people can use without having to go through what I had to go through, which I'm going to show you in a little bit. And also, if it needs to be written, it's kind of one of those things like uh, if it needs to be done and nobody's doing it, then guess whose job it is? It's your job. A little bit about me. Uh, I'm not going to I'm not going to read that. But basically, you know, my technical background is in networking forensics. That kind of stuff. I like reverse engineering and living in assembly in that world. Um, I'm one of those guys. I was very excited uh, to, to start digging into this, have the opportunity to dig into this. Um, this research is mine, not my employer's standard disclaimer applies. Um, but really, the benefit from this uh, can, can, I think, be, uh, will extend to a lot of people and a lot of people's employers. So, I decided I was going to lay this out as a uh, five stages of learning mainframe with a, with a nod to the five stages of grief um, that people go through generally when they lose something important to them. In my case, it was the last nine months of my life. Uh, so we start out with denial. So what, what'll have, what, what you'll hear when you first start working on this stuff is that, look, this is the most secure platform out there. Um, or it's antiquated, people are moving off this thing, they've been saying this now for 20 years, it's, 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 the platform's done, we're converting to Linux clusters. In some cases, that's true. Um, or it'll be like, you know, there's no sense in going down this road because you can't exploit this thing by traditional means, right? You can't do buffer overflows and shell code and, you, you know, there, you, th that sort of stuff doesn't work on this platform. It's a different architecture, it's a different CPU, different set of instructions. Um, there are protections that live on this platform that don't live on other platforms. You want more information about that? I gave a talk at DEF CON about a month ago where I go into some of that detail. Um, so I'm just going to take these point by point because this, this is what I heard and this is what you'll hear if you go down this road. Uh, let me just, let me just, I'm not even going to spend any time talking about this. It's not an obsolete platform. It's, it's used on a, in a, a lot of different companies. Uh, they, they generally are really, really big companies that uh, provide really important services to you. You can Google it if you don't believe me. So that is not the case. Antiquated technology, this is not the case either. This is a very, very sophisticated platform. It's a very modern platform. It can be configured to one of the more uh, badass things you've ever seen, frankly. Hundreds of, hundreds of cores, terabytes of RAM, uh, petabytes of data, 100% uh, uptime, um, it's, it's absolutely, if you're in it for the, you know, big iron, like really impressed by performance, that kind of stuff, this thing is, these things are out of the, out of this world. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that's not the case either. Um, traditional hacks. So the, the talk that I did give at DEF CON was basically a proof of concept about this. So I kept hearing, look, you can't do this stuff. Like you might know how to write a buffer overflow. You might know how to write shell code. It's not going to work on this platform. I'm not going to go back through that in great detail, except to just show you the basically the punchline from that talk. 
I wrote a vulnerable program. It was just an echo program. Hopefully you can read that well enough back there. But basically it's an echo program that's got an exploitable vulnerability in it, like a, a traditional buffer overflow. Um, so that's just a demo of the program in working mode. This is right out of the slides uh, from a month ago. But I was able to write shell code that execs a local shell. I made my echo program a SUID uh, program under the root user, which is a pretty standard configuration. This, what you're seeing right here, this is the mainframe, right? This is the Unix implementation, or the, the Unix interface to the mainframe. <clears throat> Not the more traditional one that you've probably seen before, but it's absolutely still running in the very same architecture, same CPUs. Every mainframe out there has this interface. So this is where I started because most people can relate to this. But in a nutshell, what happened right there was a pretty standard exploit. Like I, I wrote this exploit, I put it in a Python shell, I piped it to this vulnerable program. I was able to inherit the permissions of the root user that owned that program, and now I'm UID zero, and I have all the bells and whistles that come with that. So the point of all that was like, look, this isn't true either, right? So traditional exploits and types of exploits do work on this program, do work on this platform. If you're willing to learn the architecture, if you're willing to learn the assembly language, if you're willing to go through the, the trouble of figuring out how it manages its memory, um, this is doable. So this is, um, this is where a lot of people that I've seen start this down this road uh, end up here in number two, and that's pretty much they don't go any further than this, because I'll tell you what, there's a hell of a lot of frustration that comes along with this. Um, two main channels that the frustration comes from. One is there are a lot of people who know this platform very well. They've grown up with it. Uh, they've built some amazing uh, software on it. They uh, are unbelievably intelligent individuals. But... <laughs> Your ability to go out and hit these people and ask, ask them questions and get answers is going to be a very different experience from what you had. Uh, you go out and you want to figure something out. What do you do? You Google it. I don't know how to write this construct in C. First hit is probably Stack Overflow, where you know by now that's a completely curated response. Somebody's hit, somebody posted it. The next answer is the right one. It gives you a stub of code. You're like, perfect, that's what I needed. Occasionally, you get the trolls out there like RTFM, right? And, uh, or why do you want to do this? You know, that's my favorite response, right? Why would you want to do that? Why don't you do this other thing? Like, I didn't ask you about that. I asked you about the thing that I wanted to do. But in the mainframe world, there are forums out there about this, and it's worse. <laughs> it's way worse because you basically get the latter without the former. So I went out and Googled about this particular. Th these are actually examples I'm just going to breeze through real quick. These are examples of things that I was looking for specifically because the manuals didn't, I couldn't, I couldn't infer what I needed to know from the manuals. So we'll get into manuals in just a minute. So I'm not going to read this, but basically this guy's asking about an assembly instruction. What does it do? First guy replies with this beautiful response, which I thought, well, that looks really familiar because it's chapter and verse out of the manual. Um, so that wasn't super helpful. And then he said, can you, can you give me an example? This is the original poster. And the next guy, which is what I, this is the moderator of the forum, uh, basically mocking him in brutally, uh, telling him he's an unconscionable lazy shit and could you just spoon feed me this stuff and I'm not going to take any responsibility for my life and have a good weekend. <laughs> this is not an exception. This is what, this is how they all go, right? And then you're just, unbelievably angry and the last guy just said well I use this instruction sometimes to do this thing and it works really well so that was that and one more example that I'll give you that I searched for is a very common error message again I couldn't figure out exactly what I needed to do I googled it and the guy at the bottom just said look you need to contact your site support group you shouldn't be doing this right <laughs> that's it's, it's hilarious but that's exactly how it goes right you should be contacting your operations staff you should be contacting your system programmer like you know it's not it's not why would you want to do this? It's like, well, this is not your job. You should not be, you know, the people who know how to do this know how to do this. So talk to them. Well, I thought that's what I was doing. <laughs> Apparently not. <laughs> Documentation. So when I set up a test mainframe, one of the first things I want to do is connect it to the network and set up a basic TCP IP stack. So I went out to the IBM's website and I pulled up for this particular version of ZOS, the manual is about setting up TCP IP. There's 16 of them. It's about 60 megs of PDFs and 13,000 pages. So it's not a lack of documentation that's a problem. The problem is everything is documented to the nth degree, and there are no facts uh, or you know FAQs or how-tos, like very simple stuff. So this is something I set out to do. I started a blog and said, look, if you want to do this, like here, here is how you do it, right? This is like six steps, and it's not that hard. 
So just to give you an example, though, these are the IP configuration manuals for ZOS 1.13. So which one do you think has like the basic TCP IP setup, the IP configuration guide, the configuration reference, or maybe the user's guide, or the system administrator's guide, or the network and application and design guide? And then if you don't do it right, you can look through one of the four volumes of messages uh, <laughs> on the bottom to, to, to figure out what you did wrong. Um, and the joke that uh, Phil, some of you might know Phil Young, Soldier Fortran, is a good friend of mine, and the joke and I, that he and I have uh, about this is, like, if installing the tool is the easy part of what you're trying to do, you're not doing it on a mainframe, right? Bargaining, yeah, so this is, this is usually, this is, this, after this is where people quit, right? Everybody's gotten to this point where they download something, try to run configure in a make file or whatever, and they're like, yeah, screw it, I'm not going to install this package, I'll use something else, right? That little bit of frustration that you get when you're trying to set up that one tool, this is basically like, that is the nonstop teaching yourself how to do this. Um, and so depression sets in, right? That, like, I got to this point. Right before uh, DEF CON, when I was trying to prove something out, I knew it could be done. Just couldn't get over that next uh, hurdle. All kinds of things in your way, right? The people that are going to tell you, you need to talk to talk to the people who know how to do it. There, there aren't the how-tos and FAQs. Way too much documentation. The vernacular is different. They talk about things like DASD and on disk. They talk about sectors and tracks and cylinders. The last time you had to worry about how many cylinders, sectors, and heads you know, were on your hard drive. Probably not very recently. Um, no public disclosure of anything, so there's a very, there's very much a, uh, a culture of, of kind of keeping it all between the people who need to know. Just as an example, this, this is the, and so some of the tools that are out there are designed really for building uh, these complex products, but they're not really designed for the kind of stuff we're doing, which is like security research, trying to figure out how to patch vulnerabilities, that kind of stuff. This is a, dis this is a, uh, this is a debugger. Um, and, and, and one of the primary ones that, that, that people use to debug their assembly code in the mainframe, um, that's it, right? That's, that's the screen real estate that you get. Um, there's a lot of uh, very bizarre keyboard commands to get through that. You can do it, and I've developed using it. But, you know, for those of you who use Ida Pro or Immunity or Ollie, <laughs> yeah, you're, you're going to be sorely disappointed if you have to spend any amount of time with that. And that took me about 20 hours to get working uh, in like 10 different manuals. So um, having made it through all that, uh, which is really the, the crux of, you know, kind of what I want to talk about today, um, we're calling acceptance. So this is where you get to some layer of proficiency, right? You can write a uh, assembly program from scratch to do basic stuff. You may not know how all the APIs work, but you know exactly what manual to pull up, uh, when there's words out there that if you didn't know what they meant before, you now know what they mean when they talk about how to reference something um, by its, uh, how to reference a memory location, for instance, by its base displacement and index. You know what that means, right? You know how to get to that information if you don't know what it means. Um, and so this is where I, this is where I landed um, sometime around the day before I gave a presentation at DEF CON. Um, so, so I started, I started doing this and I said, look, I'm going to take some of the tools that Phil's written, I'm going to take some of the other tools that are out there, and I want to start bringing them together uh, in a way that is useful to people who maybe are new to the platform. Maybe they're never going to learn the platform, but maybe they're on a red team or maybe they're part of a pen testing group. Uh, or maybe they own one of these things or they work in the IT or the security department at a company that has one of these. They don't know what the hell the first thing to do. Like, how, how do we even start testing this thing? So I'm pulling them all together, and to me, I, I gave it a lot of thought, and the logical place to put all this stuff is Metasploit. So, um, so I, I took a break from learning mainframe and, and spent some time uh, learning the internals of how Metasploit works, and it, it isn't exactly the same process that I went through, but there's some similarities, funnily enough. Um, around how the internals, and if you've built, you know, deep code for Metasploit, you know what I mean. But there's a tremendous community out there. The difference is there's a tremendous community out there who are absolutely willing to help and, and, and guide you, and they're very excited about what I was trying to do. So I have a fully functional version of Metasploit with a number of things that I've written and a number of things that I've ported, and I've got a few more in the hopper that, like, you know, I was trying to finish up before this presentation about an hour ago, but didn't quite get there, but I have some demos to kind of show you what that's going to look like. So here's what I've got in there so far. Um, 
basic payloads that run on, on the mainframe. So your uh, command execution, bind shells, reverse shells. Um, I've got a built-in command shell with a decoder. I'll talk about that in a minute. And then all the core stuff, all the stuff under the scenes that you, as a user of Metasploit, never have to use or see, like defining the architecture, defining the platform, defining the instructions and the CPU and all this other kind of stuff so that things like exploits and payloads and um, auxiliary modules and all that stuff can work. This is just an example of the code. I've been posting this code once it's uh, ready for prime time. I've been posting it um, on my blog and out on GitHub. Um, which I'll give you the addresses to <clears throat> at the end of this. I am going to start putting pull requests out there. I've been talking to the guys at Metasploit, and I'm going to start putting pull requests out there for some of the basics in here, so it will be in the framework that you can download um, on GitHub soon. Um, but just as an example, so I wrote an assembly program as a bind shell, converted it to shell code, and then started uh, minimizing it, right? Try to make it as small as, as humanly possible, which for those of you who do this know that that is an absolute, like, just, you're a, it, you, it can't feed your OCD any more than trying to make a uh, payload as small as you possibly can, right? Just like shaving individual bytes out of there. Um, but this one, I, I, I wrote two flavors of this and two flavors of the next one, and I'll explain it. One of the things about the mainframe is that everything in the mainframe is in a different character set. So it's all in EBCDIC, right? Everything most of you work on is in ASCII, and they are not, they do not translate. There's no algorithm, right? It's a lookup table. It's abs it's not a, and it does not reverse either. So if you translate from ASCII to EBCDIC, you know, you have to look up at a different table to translate it back. Um, and so I was faced with the quandary of like, look, if I'm going to create a bind shell and I connect to it with like netcat or the command shell that's in Metasploit, it doesn't work, right? I'm going to send a ls minus l to a to a, a shell on the other end, and it's just going to crash because the bytes coming through are in ASCII, and it's not going to understand it. So I went uh, down the road of doing this the hard way first, both for the knowledge, but just also to see if it could be done. And I created the uh, uh, the bind shell with the with the encoder and decoder built in. So the whole payload has the EBCDIC to ASCII and ASCII to EBCDIC uh, built into it. So, but it's big, right? 1300 bytes, 1300 bytes is a pretty big uh, payload. Um, but it absolutely works. And the neat thing about it is when you launch it, and there's a reverse shell version of this too, when you launch it, you can connect to it from anything. You connect to it from Netcat, connect to it from Python, you connect to it from, from uh, Metasploit with the built-in command shell that's already there. Um, so it works really well. But it's, like I said, it's pretty big. Uh, here's a demo of it I'll show you. and. Um, I'll take a drink while this is running, but the neat thing, I was showing this to somebody and said, yeah, well, that just looks like, that just looks like the Metasploit I do if I'm, if I'm exploiting Linux or Windows or anything else. And it's like, yep, that's, thank you. That's, that's, that's exactly right. So that window on the top is my Metasploit uh, console, and the window on the bottom is is my uh, is my mainframe. And it basically just to show you that it 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 works exactly how you would expect, right? If you have a vulnerable program, you have an exploit, you set up a payload, set up your ports, set up your IP addresses, and boom, easy. Uh, I built the the reverse shell um, after I built the bind shell. Reverse shell, if you've done this, is much easier and much less complex. Um, there's only a few instructions in a reverse shell. And I also built this one at first, then I built it without the encoder in it. So this is a really standard uh, layout for reverse shell. You know, you um, create a socket, create a connection, uh, point all your file handlers at uh, a new process that you exec, and then you, you pass it off and create the connection. Um, so I built it without the encoder decoder in it. So this one, when it launches, if you connect to it, you are responsible for doing the encoding and decoding what I mean by that is the, the character set translation between ASCII and EBCDIC on the client side. What that allows for is a much, much smaller client, much, much smaller shell code. So this is only 300 bytes. That's fairly respectable size. And uh, if you find you know, vulnerabilities in programs, finding 300 bytes is not very hard. By, by contrast, I think the reverse shell in Metasploit for Linux without any encoding uh, is like 86 bytes. Um, 
the, the, the system Z assembler is always going to be more verbose because arguments get passed by uh, memory location. So you have to pass, if you have to pass five arguments to an API, you have to pass a memory location that has the value of the argument in it. So by, by, by its nature, it's going to be larger. There's, it's not going to be able to get it as small as something where you can pass it by um, reference or pass it by register. So I'll, I'm going to just, I'll just skip to the end of this and basically you can see same exact thing you can see on the bottom there. Um, we've got our reverse shell. Works exactly the same way. Once you've got your shells, then you can start doing some neat stuff uh, with post exploitation. And I've just only really scratched the surface of this, but I have a tremendous lot of ideas on where to go with this. And if anybody else has any ideas, I'd be really interested in hearing it. But once you've got a shell, then you can uh, uh, then you can script all kinds of stuff, right? You can enter TSO commands, you can enter Unix commands. If you've got a set of credentials, you can do some even more cool stuff. So here's a post module that I wrote that dumps the RACF database, pulls it back to the host, and cracks the passwords. Um, and so this is a combination of a Metasploit module that I wrote that uses the stuff that I wrote, some built-in uh, uh, Metasploit tools that are already there, uh, and the, the John the Ripper, uh, which already has support for cracking RACF database, which is the RACF is the mainframe's um, authorization, authentication, IBM's version of it. So yeah, so this works again, just like you would expect. You run the post module because you've already got a session. You can see the, the, the communication there back from the mainframe says, yep, you have access to this database, transfer it to your machine, run John the Ripper on it, and then you can see all the awesome passwords um, that it was able to crack, which is fantastic. So one of the things I'll show you here before I wrap up, this is a work in progress, so this is not ported to Metasploit yet, but I do have it in Ruby, so I'm kind of most of the way there. Um, I'm not a Ruby guy either, so in the process of learning this, I had to learn Ruby. Um, this was written by Phil in a, in, a, uh, in a Python library, and I ported it to Ruby to, to be able to start putting it in, into Metasploit. 3270 is the TN3270 is a protocol that sits on top of TCP IP. It's what the uh, um, emulators use to talk back and forth. You've seen the green screens people use to talk to mainframes. Like, that's the protocol. It's, it's basically Telnet on steroids. Um, and so what you can do with this module in, in Metasploit is if you have a set of credentials that you've got from some other means, social engineering, or you capture them on the wire, something like that, you can punch them in. And now you can actually enter TN3270 commands, file transfer, that kind of stuff, and it will scrape the screen and pull it back to you. So you don't actually have to have a client. You can just operate right within Metasploit and do, uh, do what you need to do. So it looks something like this. And this, again, like I'm, I'm running it in raw Ruby here, not in the framework because I don't have it built in the framework yet. So that's the, that is the, uh, Log on screen to my mainframe right there. That's the next screen after I entered a command. I put my name and password in, and then that's the screen that you get once you logged in, right? So all that was done with a very simple script that just uses a set of username and password that I cracked in the previous slide uh, to now be able to get that screen, which is the exact same thing if you went and logged on to the mainframe yourself, right? If you went, if you went and did these commands, and I'm not going to do it live, but I'll just type the one in. Basically the same thing. So you can see the possibilities um, there. So I think, yeah, so what's next? Um, I'm working with some people who are much smarter than I am on compiling some of the basics that aren't out there right now, like uh, GCC and the new utilities. Um, right now, it's it's basically like AIX and a lot. It's like straight Unix, so it's not the stuff that you're used to on Linux. It doesn't have a lot of that stuff. Um, uh, a debug framework, like a proper debug framework, is something that I'm absolutely will be the next thing that uh, I build that allows you to do proper debugging on this platform, uh, disassembly debugging, that kind of stuff. Further additions, uh, customized interpreter, right? That's maybe something that you can load into memory that's got a whole bunch of really unique functions to this platform, kind of like the interpreter you're used to. Something that writes JCL, which is like the scripting language uh, on the main form and, and, and can transfer that back and forth if you have a set of credentials or a vulnerability that you're using. And tr training and teaching. So that's it. I've got, um, I think, like one minute maybe, maybe two, if anybody's got a question. Otherwise, I'm probably going to go get a beer after this. If you've got a question, you can uh, come see me there. But I just want to say thanks to Phil for helping out. He built this, the uh, uh, 
awesome slide background and the title slide on this. Um, so anyway, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, question asked was, uh, uh, Phil wrote uh, basically has extended an uh, Nmap to be able to better identify mainframes and some stuff like that. So the the uh, library that that was written on is that TN3270 library. So we'll be able to use all that functionality in inside inside Metasploit. So you can scan it and get uh, you know valuable scan results and that kind of stuff. Anybody else have any questions? Yep. Yeah, it's a good question. So where do you get the test mainframe from? So um, my employer is a mainframe, so that helps. IBM has a virtual mainframe and that they will they will sell you. And um, if you work for a company that has a relationship with them, you can probably get a you know a reasonable price on it. But they have one that runs. Uh, this is a hypervisor that is their product that runs the actual version of the OS. So you can run it on a Linux box or Unix box or Mac or whatever. Um, so you can take it with you. They sell it to people who do development on the mainframe, that kind of stuff. Yep. Say like iSeries. Um, I haven't done iSeries for a, for a long time. It was uh, something I did a long time ago. So I, I don't know the answer to that question as far as like how much of it directly translates. Um, I suspect a lot of the concepts translate, but it's not, you know, it's going to be, it's a totally different architecture, different CPU and all that kind of stuff. Um, talk to me afterwards. I got a name for you, not off the top of my head, but I can look it up. Anybody else? So I think we got to wrap up. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yeah.